I was just introduced to our brother this morning. I'd heard about him last night uh, through our sister Sophia, which many of you know, gave her testimony a while back, and her husband David there. And so, and, and matter of fact, what they do in evangelizing among the Muslims. And this brother, uh, I, I don't know a whole lot about him, but I know enough. Number one, I prayed about it. Number two, met him this morning. There was, you know, just, you, you automatically try the spirits. I mean, you just know, and the Spirit of God will witness. And then as we were sitting in the back just now, also talking a bit, I see a future. <laughs> so we're, um, we're, we're pleased about uh, what God is doing. But I want to uh, bring our sister Sophia up, and she will introduce you to our brother and to his testimony, and then I'll be back after that. So there you go, my sister. Give it to you. God bless you. Good to see you. Thank you. Thank you, Pastor Curry Blake. Uh, he has graciously uh, opened the opportunity this morning for me to introduce you to a wonderful speaker. Uh, let me tell you what happened this weekend, actually. Um, are you, first of all, aware that Muslims are having dreams and visions around the world? I'm sure you've heard of that by now. And it's even abundant in America, okay? So the Lord is doing amazing things. And uh, we had a conference this weekend at the Hope Center with the partnership of E3 Partners Ministry, I Am Second, and as well as Manifold Hope. They both came together and we put on a conference and I helped facilitate the conference. And so we met a brother there and he's going to share this morning. Let me introduce you to his name is Hazim. Hazim was born into the Palestinian American family and he is nine of 13 children. Grab a hold of that, ladies. <laughs> and um, so Hazim currently is the host of a TV show called Reflections on TBN and on other networks. I'm sure you have seen him. I saw him recently, in fact, um, which, reaches, um, uh, which, which reaches in Arabic and English language all over the world. And so he speaks, he's very well spoken. He speaks to around to about 400 million viewers. That's how many people view his humor show. So, uh, he's basically, he communicates a message of hope and in God's love, basically. So I want to just give you, this is just a brief introduction of Brother Hazim. Please give a warm welcome to him this morning. Thank you. I, I do have to say, um, for the sake of not exaggerating, it's a potential viewership of 400 million. <laughs> I would be a celebrity if 400 million viewers watched the show. So. Just for my conscience sake, how are y'all doing? Great. Can I use y'all in Texas? Yeah. If I said that in California, they wouldn't understand what I'm saying. So I love the South. God totally transformed my life in the South. Excuse me while I put this on real quick. Test one, okay. Um, are we on, can you hear me? Yeah. Okay. So as uh, Sophia told you guys, my, my ethnicity is Palestinian. I was born in Brooklyn, New York in 1984. And my father, as we grew in years, or as we grew and got, my, especially my father, as he grew in years and got more older, he wanted to teach us and to indoctrinate us with the ways of Islam. Now, we were raised up Islamic in America. You see, it's, the Arabic culture is much like the Jewish culture. It, it's almost similar, in fact. And it's a semi-language, a semi-culture, a semi-way of life, which that means if you're in Holland and you're Arab or Jewish, you're not from Holland, you're just living in Holland. And so that was how we were in America. And um, so the cult, there was no culture shock when my father decided to move our family to Jerusalem ethnically. That, I don't know if you, most of you probably understand the politics between Israel and the Palestinians. Well, when I was 12 in 1997, my father returned the whole family to Jerusalem. And the intention was for all of us to become better Muslims, to become better uh, acquainted with our ways, our culture, our religion. And so that's what we did. Now for me, um, for me, it was, it, it, was a, it was a shock, to be honest with you. See, my father wanting to remove us from the Christian American culture took us to where the Christian American culture was born. And so I started seeing streets like the street of the Holy Sepulchre and, and the Via della Rosa Road. And I started seeing signs that said David's tomb. And I started seeing signs that, said, that had all these biblical names. And so I began to ask questions. Now, many of you know that the Islamic culture is very deep within the people. If you know any Muslims, you, you know, if, they're, if they're true Muslim, you know that that's the case. 
So for us, it was not even, in fact, sometimes I have to pinch myself and ask myself, am I really preaching? Am, am I really a Christian because it was so far from our radar? My father built a five-story building before we got to Jerusalem in 1997, and he wanted it to be used as a means of, uh, as a means of income. So uh, about a year into my journey in Jerusalem, I began to have a, what I call a crisis of faith. I don't know if you've ever experienced a crisis, but a crisis is when you can't run away from the problem. Wherever you go, it's going to follow you. Mm -hmm. and, and, and even more deep than just a crisis externally, this was a crisis on the inside. Suddenly, I began to doubt and to question the very thing that made up who we were as a people and as a race. You ask any Arab man, what is the glory of the Arab society? And he'll tell you, Islam is the glory of the Arab society. And the Quran is the glorious message of, that we gave the world. In fact, there are scriptures in the Islamic doctrine that says, uh, the, the Muslim people are the, the blessing of God to the world. So for me to begin to doubt this, I was in essence doubting who I was as a person. And not only that, I was doubting my family, I was doubting my culture, and I was doubting everything I was taught. It felt like the ground that I was standing on became sinking sand. My question today is, have you ever experienced a crisis in your life? You can't run from it, you just have to wait for it to be over. Right about that time, I began, mind you, giving my heart to Islam and giving my heart to the culture and giving my heart to all of these things. I did my checklist. I prayed. I went to the mosque, the beautiful dome of the rock on, on the Temple Mount. I, I've been there many times praying, putting my head on the floor with my father, and, and that's what we did. You see, when you're seeking God, I call it the checklist. You do your checklist. If you're Jewish, whatever religion you are, you pray, you fast, you read your book. So I was doing that. I was reading the Quran. I was memorizing the verses. I was going to, in fact, I had an Islamic class every day, six days a week. I, I went to a, a school that was teaching American, in English, teaching everything that we would have to know to get our diploma and to get our high school education, but we had to have it Islamically. And so for me, at the end of the checklist is where I found myself. Now, can I, can I share something with you? And I'm not knocking any other religion, but, but do you know the fact that you feel and sense the presence of God is a miracle in and of itself? Yeah. Did you know that today 1.6 billion people will pray five times a day, most of them will pray five times a day and will never sense the presence of God? And I found myself in this crisis of faith. And about that time, Remember the five-story building my father brought, you know, built before we got there. There came a really nice, sweet-looking blonde lady with her husband, and she knocks on the door, and she had a southern drawl, and she said, We heard y'all were looking, were, were, had an apartment. We're looking for one. Do y'all have one? And it turns out these were Rama Bible graduate missionaries. <laughs> and my father, being a good Middle Easterner, he said, Absolutely, give me your money and move in. <laughs> and so that was one about a year a, a little over a year into that journey and for the next year and a half I began to meet and get to know the happy people I call them the happy people <laughs> and I wish I could tell you that I was happy for them being happy but I, I wasn't <laughs> because I was taught things like the Jews and the, the Christians are infidels mm -hmm. and I remember it was such a Anomaly for me. Did I say that word? Is that an anomaly? Yeah. I'm glad I didn't say monopoly, right? <laughs> um, I, it was such a, it was such a curiosity in me. Why are these infidels so nice? And I got to know them, and they would smile, and they were, they, they loved Jesus, and I thought they were crazy. And so one day, I, I just fell in love with them so much so that I took my Qur'an upstairs and I began to read to them what the Qur'an and the Islamic religion teaches about infidels and Jews. And, you know, it was probably an awkward moment for them because I was reading them stuff that, you know, I, just, I won't even go there this morning. <laughs> so I was reading to them how they were going to be eternally damned and how God had cursed the Jews and the Christians. 
Some ver in fact, there is a verse in there that says that the, the Jews and Christians are descendants of apes and pigs. Mm. And I know how I'm a jerk, aren't I? Like telling them to their faces, but it was what I had. I loved them. It was from a good place. And they said, Hazem, we'll have this conversation if you will promise one thing. I said, what's that? They said, we will have this conversation if you promise to never tell anybody that we're having this conversation. I looked at them being so macho and I said, trust me, no one will ever know. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not trying to, to start any trouble, you know. And so that conversation lasted that year and a half. And towards the end, I found myself in a church in Jerusalem. First time in my life I ever went to church. Mind you, I'm still in this crisis of faith. A Muslim never goes to bed Muslim and wakes up Christian. It's just, it, we don't go to church and raise our hand every Sunday. And, you know, that's just not how we do it there. It, it, it really is a sacrificial thing to follow the Lord. And so for me, for, the, for that season, I, would, I remember thinking, okay, if, the, if, if my Christian friends really, really know God, if, if what they're telling me is true, then, then what am I doing facing Mecca every, f to, truthfully, four times a day? And it was that struggle on the inside. And remember that checklist I told you about? If you're, if you're a sincere seeker with your checklist, most people will never do the checklist. Most people, in fact, are sleeping on this Sunday morning because they're just not interested. In the, va the vast majority of humanity is just not worried about eternity. And so for me, I was real enough and sincere enough with my own life that when I got the end, to the end of the checklist, I realized something is wrong. I really, have you ever prayed and when you're praying, the heavens seem like brass and your prayers fall right down sure. right before you? That's what it felt like. And so I started asking difficult questions. I started, I started asking, why are we supposed to dislike a certain group of people? And why, when they're so nice, I, I found out real quick that I, I was asking difficult questions nobody wanted to, to be asked. So I just internalized it. Finally, I'll fast forward to that church in Jerusalem. They said, Hazem, we're going to McDonald's. Would you like to come? I said, sure. I haven't had a Big Mac in two and a half years, um, truthfully. Uh, there's, there, was only two big, there was only two McDonald's in all of Israel at the time, and one was in Jerusalem. The other one was in, in the north, in, in Galilee, or Tel Aviv, I think. And so I said, sure, we'll, I'll go to, to, the, to McDonald's. And they said, but we're going to go to church first. So do you have a ride or... I was, I was a teenager, plus I'm not going to even try to get a ride to go to church then. To, it just didn't make sense. I said, oh, that's fine. I'll just ride with you guys. So they said, okay. We went to church. They said, you feel free to sit in the car or just meet us back here in about an hour and a half. Well, I said, don't be ridiculous. I'll go inside. This is okay, you know. So for the first time in my life, I went to church. And I went to church. I put on a big obnoxious coat with a big hoodie so nobody sees me walking in and I, when I got in I took it off I sat in the back corner and I was amazed I saw more happy people <laughs> <laughs> I saw a man in the in the front with his guitar he was smiling looking up and he was singing to Jesus and he he was at the end of his checklist happy and I was not I saw people in the front, just like we had today, worshiping the Lord. I saw people with their hands raised up. I saw people weeping tears of joy. I saw, I saw interaction between heaven and earth. And it made me so mad. <laughs> just being honest. I was what we would call a hater, you know? Someone who's just jealous. I wish I could say I, I, I felt the, the convi- I didn't. I was in that and I got so uneasy. I said, okay. I'm, I, I, have to, I have to get rid of this emotionalism, and I need to be a good Muslim. So I pulled out my beads. Praise Allah, praise Allah, praise Allah, praise Allah, praise Allah. And then there's no God but Allah and Muhammad is His messenger. I, and I started doing the beads, that, the, the, what, kind of like the Catholics have their beads, we had ours. And uh, 20 minutes later, I'm still watching them love Jesus, sing happily, and, and I'm sitting there with my beads. <laughs> and I thought, okay, this is not working, you know. So I said, okay, I, first time I ever went to a church. I said, okay, this is not, this is not okay. I, I need to pray. I, I went downstairs, found an empty room, and I faced towards Mecca, and I prayed 
the darkest prayer I had ever prayed. You know, Jacob wrestled with the Lord, right? That was, that was the end of my wrestle with the Lord. And here's why that prayer was dark. It wasn't because God was not there. It was because I did not want to see the God that was there. And finally, at the end of that prayer, with this righteous anger, I looked up to heaven and I said, you know what? I quit. I quit. I quit doing your job. For three years, you see me struggling to hold on to this faith that I'm supposed... I pray to heaven that you are who they said you are. And I pray to heaven that Muhammad is not a false prophet. Because I know what's before me if this this was reality. And I said, but nonetheless, if you are who those happy people are worshipping, I choose right now, I quit this fight, and I'm going to find the truth. So whoever you are... I'm up for grabs. And I went upstairs, and they're still happy singing and worshiping the Lord. And this time, I wasn't angry. This time, I was actually enjoying that these people who reached the end of their checklist found what they were looking for. And it was the next day, I went up to the Christians, and I said, you know what? I made this decision. I quit doing God's job. I'm going to pray. And if I have to pray in the name of Jesus, I'll just whisper it. And I'm, it'll be a secret, you know. They said, Hazim, we will do this with you. And we're, we're thrilled that you have come to this conclusion. Because they knew my struggle. They said, but we have to do one thing. I said, what's that? They said, you cannot tell a soul. I looked at them very macho and very strong. And I said, trust me, it ain't happening. I'm not telling anybody. And so for the next few years, I ended up being an underground believer. The war began in in the year 2000, and that's when we returned to America. In the year 2000, we returned to America, and it was such a hard time in my life. It was a hard time in my life because here we were, we left America to run into, at least for me, to run into the Jewish Messiah, Jesus. And now that I actually submitted to the Jewish Messiah, now we're coming back to America. It was so confusing. And so... I, I remember the war had just really confused me. The war, you know, I was, as a Palestinian, I was being told the things that Israel was doing to the Palestinians. And none, no doubt, the Israeli channels were propagating what the Palestinians were doing. To, it was just a big mess. It was war. Nothing good can come out of war. And so I got on my knees and I said, God, if the Jews are your people, why are they killing my people? Now, I understand it was a very biased prayer. It was a very prejudiced prayer. It was a very ignorant prayer. Nonetheless, it was my prayer. At 15 years old, it was my prayer. And suddenly I fell asleep and out of, I remember it was a dark room and out of the darkness came a man. And I thought I was, I thought I I was losing my mind. This man looked like Jesus. He had a beard like Jesus. He had long hair, wavy, it wasn't straight. And by the way, he doesn't look like uh, the British guy on the movie we saw with the blue eyes. <laughs> he had a tan, he had brown eyes, and he was majestic. Mm-hmm. The best thing I can describe him as is that he was the crossover between a priest and a shepherd. And he looked at me and said, read Isaiah 22. Now, I didn't have a Bible. I, he, Isaiah, who was Isaiah? I did, he could have been a cartoon character. I had no idea. So I, I woke up and I, know, I knew whoever this man was in my dream was a high priest. I, I never heard that term, high priest. So I went upstairs to the Christians and I said, I had this dream, I think it was Jesus. And this is what he said. They said, Hazem, do you have, a, you have a Bible where you can see? I, I said, I, ha- I couldn't have a Bible. It was not safe to have a Bible. And they said, well, we have a prophet named the prophet Isaiah. And in the Bible, he has a book, and it's called the book of Isaiah. Let's read it. And when I I began to read it in the NIV, or the message uh, translation, it was as if I was reading a newspaper. Now, not all the verses were for me, but some of them were just amazingly precise. In a time of war, Jesus shows up to me and says, read Isaiah 22. And here's... And me, with a broken heart, I pray a very biased prayer, and he responds to this very biased prayer, and he tells me to read Isaiah 22. How does Isaiah 22 begin? It says this, O city of Jerusalem, city of tumult and chaos. 
what is happening in your streets. You go to the rooftops to see all your men dying. At the time, we would go to the rooftops. I would go to see the wars, to see the helicopters going back and forth, to see the stones being thrown. That's, we were in a strategic part of, of, of Jerusalem. Just about a mile or two away was the West Bank, so that was a key spot to where I could see it all from the fifth floor. And then verse 4 of Isaiah 22 ministered to me like unbelievably. Verse 4, God says, Depart from me and do not try to console me. Let me to weep bitterly for the destruction of my people. And suddenly this biased prayer is responded to by a living God who I, remember, this is a big contrast to the guy with the checklist who never heard from God before, right? And all of a sudden God is showing me his emotions. Sovereignly, I know what a high priest is. Isaiah 22, verse 22 says, I will give to him the keys to the house of David, and no man, can, no man can open the doors that he closes, and no man can close the doors that he opens. They said, Hazim, this is a type of Jesus. And they took me to Revelation chapter 3, where, it's, where Jesus says, I am he who holds the keys to the house of David. I open doors that no man can close, and I close doors no man can open. This biased prayer was responded to in a dream by a Savior who was humble enough to come and answer it. And the solution was the man in verse 22, Jesus. So we end up coming to America. I'm at this time still an underground believer. I, I, at the age of 17, I just couldn't handle living a double life. So the rubber met the road and I... I left home in the name of college. My father, being uh, the patriarch of the family, he, he thought he made a mistake by allowing me to leave for college. So he demanded I return home. And I said, I said, I can't come home. He said, Hazen, why can't you come home? First time I consciously ever disobeyed my father. I said, I can't come home because I can't live the way we've been living. And he said, if you don't be, if you're not at the house in 12 hours, don't ever look back. And that was about 12 years ago. And 12 years ago, he, since then, he has kept his word. But the Lord has brought a whole lot of, I mean, I see some of your faces. So, trust me, it's, you don't ever get over stuff like that. You get through it. And with grace, God helps you. So I, you, you look at me, don't, don't pity me. Because I, I wouldn't trade it for the world because of what I've learned walking this out. So to make a long story short, I ended up for the next six months sleeping my life away. I ended up watching, literally, I would, I would either f to listen to the radio or flip through the channels, and then I would sleep for 16, 17 hours a day. I didn't know I was depressed. It's when you have no energy to get out of bed. I used to think people who said they were depressed were just whiners until I couldn't get out of bed. And one day I was flipping through the channels. There was a man on television. He was dressed in a white outfit and he was praying for people. And I thought, this guy is kind of weird, but he sounds like us. And it was Benny Hinn on television. <laughs> <laughs> <All right. laughs> so he had our accent and I, be, I just kept on watching. And that voice on the inside said, I have called you to this. And I remember it was so deep, it was, it was so loud it deafened me. It was so loud and so true. I knew, I didn't know it was the Holy Spirit, but I knew whatever this voice was, it was life-changing. And I'm trying to get out of bed every morning. Mm -hmm. And I'm supposed to preach. I had no idea what, the, what that meant later, and I'll, I'll connect the dots for you. So I turned the TV off, and I did what I knew to do. I escaped it. I went back to bed. But something supernatural happened the next morning that I can't explain. At 8 in the morning, I woke up with a desire to get out of bed. And suddenly, I wasn't depressed anymore. Even though in my mind, I had rejected the thought, my body had responded to the purpose that God had spoken to me. And uh, it, the details are, I'll spare you the details, but to make a, a long story short, I began to get plugged into the local church I started doing the faithful, boring things that we, you know, the checklist, pray, fast, watch, keep this submitted to the Lord. And before no time, I started meeting right, the, the right people at the right time, favor, mix in some favor in there. 
and here I am, I'll, we'll fast forward to about three years ago. Three years ago, I'm now working for Dr. Paul Crouch from TBN. And Paul Crouch says to me, he goes, Hazem, I, I have this feeling that you should be doing television. I said, Dr. Crouch, I, I have this feeling that you are wrong. <laughs> <laughs> Mind you, not connecting the dots from when that voice spoke to me. And for three months, we went back and forth. He, he kept on telling me, the Lord, I feel the Lord saying, you need to do this. And because of fear, I rejected it. And one day he said, Hazim, I have presented to you an opportunity. I pray you have the wisdom to make the right choice. And so at that word right there, it just struck me because I realized I had gotten to the end of the rope. And now I had to make a decision whether to put feet to my faith or to resist the opportunity. You know, you could pray for 20 years, Lord, use me, Lord, use me, Lord, use me. And one day the Lord's going to say, okay, I'm ready to use you. And we're going to have to decide to get up off of our knees and to actually walk towards whatever God is calling us to do. And that's where I was. And so from that point on, the, the Lord, I surrendered to the Lord. I ended up praying about it for two weeks, and the Lord gave me Isaiah 65, verse 1. I had never, never heard this verse in there, but it, it basically says this. He goes, I have revealed, God says, I revealed myself to those who were not even looking for me. I have said to those who, who were not called by my name, I said, here I am, here I am. And I had a word from the Lord. And I had a promise from God that if you step out in faith and preach the word, I will step in and answer their cries. So, to make a long story, I know I keep saying that, the story is not getting any shorter, right? <laughs> um, I ended up praying for the Lord to tell me what to say, and it, the Lord said, give them John 3.16. And I thought, how simple is that? I want to give them revelation. I don't want to give them John 3.16, right? And what I found out because of my obedience to following what I felt in my heart, the Lord, the Lord started coming through, and I realized that most of the Arab world have never heard of John 3.17 or 3.16. And so now what, the wisdom of the Lord was that He totally is coming through on this thing. When He gave me Isaiah 65.1, I can show you stories, emails, letters. I even got a few just recently. And here's the thing. We sit in church and we're like, wow, praise the Lord. God, God connected the dots. So I have called you to this. Remember that word? Now I'm preaching the gospel on television and I'm kind of like a younger version of that guy I saw on television. The dots connected. Now, that's great here in church. But on the other side of the world or on the other side of the city, there's, a, there's, a, there's other people who don't believe like us who would get agitated at that story. In fact, I have a picture I want to show you. Because of the platform, because now Reflections airs in two languages 23 times a week on six different channels, and it's, it's increasing the favor. If, I'm on Facebook, by the way, so you may have seen this picture. This picture was about a few months ago when all of the craziness in Egypt started happening. They started persecuting the, 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 the believers. This man right here is burning a Bible. And if you see, you see the, the police right there, they're just letting it happen. And every, it seems like they're kind of just encouraging this guy to do this. So I thought, what would I tell that one man? What would I tell him? Because it, it, it irked me on the inside that the police are just standing there. Now, I posted on Facebook, I said, you can burn our Bible, but you can never burn Jesus. You can never burn the message. You can, you can burn that paper, but the message will never go away. Now that's a pretty, if you ask me, that's a pretty awesome statement, right? It, it wasn't meant to be like an anti-Islamic thing. It was just meant to be, this is what we believe. And because of that one picture, I got an influx of emails and hate mail. And I just got, and I, re, I, I prayed. I said, Lord, why something that simple caused such an uproar? And I began to, I, honestly, I felt intimidated because I'm thinking, I'm just preaching the gospel and they're getting angry because he's, they're burnt. Look, that man, not there, they're not all b burning our Bibles, but that man was burning our Bible. And so the Lord took me to John chapter 20. He said, Hazem, this is what it's going to take for people like that man to stop burning the Bible. And for the sake of time, I'm just going to, I'm, I'm going to, uh, I won't read all of the verses, I'll tell you where I'm reading. 
Early Sunday morning, while it was still dark, Mary Magdalene came to the tomb and found that the stone had been rolled away. She ran and found Simon Peter and the other disciple. They have taken away the Lord's body out of the tomb. Peter and the other disciple ran to see. Verse 8, Then the other disciple went in, he saw, and he believed. For until then they hadn't realized that the scripture said he would rise from the dead. Verse 11, Mary was standing outside the tomb crying, and as she wept, she stooped in and looked, and she saw two white-robed angels sitting at the head and the foot of the place where Jesus had been lying. Why are you crying? The angels asked her. Because they have taken away my Lord, she replied. And I don't know where they have put him. Have you ever wondered where Jesus was in your situation? Sure. Have you ever wondered where the living Messiah is in your life? No doubt she was in this place. She glanced over her shoulder and saw someone standing there, standing behind her, and it was Jesus, but she did not recognize him. The praise team, you guys can come up real quick. She did not recognize him. Why are you crying, Jesus? Red letters. And who are you looking for? Now, isn't it amazing that red letters of Jesus, she's looking for Jesus. He's speaking right to her, red letters, and she does not recognize him. You see, all over the Muslim world, they say we recognize Jesus, but they don't recognize him. One of the, the, one of the most, for me, one of the most wearisome conversations is when I have to tell my Muslim friends, you don't believe in Jesus. You believe in the version that you created in your Qur'an. That's who you believe in. You don't believe in the Son of God. You believe in a man. It's intriguing to me. Why are you crying? She's looking for Jesus and He's talking to her. Have you ever, have you ever been looking for Jesus and not recognized that He was right there with you in your situation? She thought He was the gardener, she said. Sir, if... If you have taken him away, tell me where you have put him, and I will go and get him. And Jesus said to her one word. One word. One word. He didn't preach to her. He didn't give her the Sermon of the Mount. He didn't give her the, 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 the doctrine. No. He didn't give her a TV show. He didn't give her a Bible. He gave her one word. So what does it take for the Muslim people to know that Jesus Christ is the Lord? It's one word. And that one word is this. Jesus looks at her and he says, Mary. He calls her by her name. And immediately it says, she turned towards him and she exclaimed, Teacher, capital T. And Jesus said, I have not yet ascended, but go and tell everybody that I'm ascending to my Father, and to your Father, to my God, and to your God. What does it take for the Muslim world to recognize Jesus? It takes the Muslim world to hear the living Savior call out their name, because Allah never called out their name. Muhammad, that's, right. that's a different story. Right. Don't... <laughs> and listen to what she says next. Verse 18, Mary Magdalene found the disciples and she told them I I have seen the Lord and I found I found it really amazing in my walk in my experience with reflections and the program and ministering to the to, to two worlds I found that he's so kind to reveal himself like he said in Isaiah 65 1 I have revealed myself to people who were not even looking for me I can take you to the place where I met an underground Bible study in Jerusalem. And I looked to the brother on my right and I said, how did you come to know the Lord? And mind you, I'm supposed to be telling them how missionaries intercepted me in a crisis of faith and yada. And I look at him and I say, I say, how, how did you come to the Lord? He said, oh, well, Jesus came to me. What does that mean, Jesus came to you? I didn't want to put him on the spot. You know what I'm saying? Like, I didn't want him to feel... I said, can you explain to me what that means, Jesus came to, to you? And he said, just like you're sitting there, I saw him. I could touch him, I could feel him, and Jesus 
took me to, the, to Jerusalem, to the southern steps and said, he pulled out the, the, a book from the stone and he said, he said, preach my word. He said, at that moment, I knew he was the son of God. Me being utterly humbled, I, I, missionaries intercepted me. Jesus came to him. I said, praise God. I looked over trying to run from that. I, I said, and the sister on my left says, she goes, oh, because she recognized my utter shock. And she says, oh, Hazem, most of us have come to the Lord through dreams and visions. And I said, well, how did you come? She said, for a year, I would have the dream of the man dressed in white. And there was so much light around him, I couldn't see him, but I knew there was one man in that light. She said, for, for, that, for that year, I didn't know what, who this was. I called him the light. <laughs> Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, right, and the life. No man comes to the Father but through me. You want, you want to see what God is doing in the Muslim world? Turn off the news and start praying and seeing it by the Spirit. Because what we are seeing is a whole different situation than what the news is saying. I determined I'm not going to let the news tell me what's happening in the Middle East. I'm going to let the Holy Ghost tell me, right? Amen. So I encourage you today, if you are bored with your faith in Jesus, I I implore you, He could be speaking right to you and you not recognize Him. Today, what are you going to do to recognize Jesus? I'm almost sure, I'm 100% I'm, I'm sure that if you would listen just a little bit, you can hear Him, not calling my name, not calling your neighbor's name, but calling your name. God bless you guys. Amen. Amen. <clears throat> Just as he said there, especially even at the end, talking about the turn off the news and quit listening to what they tell you, <clears throat> it is in the news's interest to have conflict. Why? Because if it bleeds, it leads. If there's fighting, if there's bloodshed, it'll make the first story in the news. And the more they can generate that, then the more news they have. <clears throat> when it's a quiet day, it's a bad day for news. And yet that's exactly what we're told to pray for, for the peace of Jerusalem. It doesn't just say that so that Jerusalem would be quiet and there'd be no fighting in Jerusalem, but it means that it, literally at the very heart that there'd be peace on earth, goodwill toward men. <clears throat> this, um, as he was, as their brother was speaking, I was, went back to Isaiah chapter 9 and it it stood out to me of what the scripture says that the people that walked in darkness saw a great light yeah. and that they walked in the in the shadow of death and yet their yoke had been broken and all of these things that God had done for them so I, there's people here today and and that people watching by internet right now around the world and so even right now this is kind of twofold you know too, too often we're so set in okay now we're going to give this call and then we're going to give this call and just as he said it's in the heart it, it's it's we make our checklist and that's for our end that's not on his end and we might go through our checklist and you can go through your checklist and just as he said still end up em empty but if you just turn your heart toward God, if you just pour your heart out toward Him, there's no set sinner's prayer. It's a sinner's heart that is turned toward God that says, I don't want to be like this anymore. I want you in control of my life. I want to give myself to you. And when you do that, no matter what words you use, God hears and answers. I, I, I really have a problem at times the way people will say, well, God doesn't hear this and he doesn't hear that. And, he says, and, and, and there, there, there is some truth at times. But what keeps God from hearing, if in anything, is the hardness of your heart. Not that he is standing back saying, I'm not going to listen to you. But it's your hardness of heart toward him. And that can be, unfortunately, even in the lives of 
Christians. Mm -hmm. That they've hardened their heart to only see Jesus the way their group says to see him. Religion's religion. And it's all geared toward keeping you away from God. And when we talk about religious groups and things like that. Just as we have said before, in the garden with Adam, there was no temple, no altar, no sacrifice, no services. It was just God walking with man in relationship, speaking face to face, talking heart to heart. And as Christians, we've got to reach the world in, in every aspect. Christianity was supernatural from the beginning. It's supernatural all the way through. It should always be supernatural. If we're going to feed the hungry, it should be supernatural. It shouldn't be just what we can gather. We ought to be able to, we, we do everything we can, but then we expect God to meet the needs of the people. If that means multiply food, so be it. If it means whatever it means, so be it. So, as we finish here today. I'm going to ask all of you to go ahead and stand. Now there's some people here that I don't recognize. Uh, I've never seen you before. I'm not going to assume just because I don't know you that you're not, you know, that you're lost, okay? Because um, I don't know everybody, but on the other hand, I'm, I don't want to just automatically assume that you are where you need to be with God and just let that opportunity bypass. Now, this is not about getting the altar full or, you know, the front area full or, or you know, counting a number of hands or raised. That, that ain't got nothing to do with this. This is about you being in contact with the living God. Not an idea, not a concept, not an icon, but literally in contact and connection with the living God. And the only way that happens, as we've, we just heard from our brother, is through his son, Jesus. There's a lot of people that pray in all kinds of different names. But the only name under heaven whereby men must be saved is the name of Jesus. And so we are we're thankful, number one, that we, we know this truth. But just as Leonard Ravenhill used to say, nobody has a right to hear the gospel twice until everybody's heard it once. We cannot be satisfied to be a local body. We have to realize what's going on. As even before service this morning, I was looking at the voice of the martyrs. I, I get their updates and what's going on. And you know, there's just so much that I want to do that I know God has put in my heart to do to reach the world. I know it's Him that you know that He put it there. It's not me. Because anything in me that's any good is of Him. And so I know that what he wants us to do is so amazing that if we looked at it, probably all of us would just scatter and run because we'd say, no way, that's too big, it's too much, how can we ever do that? But our, our job is not to ask how, it's just to ask what. What would you have us do? And then as we step our foot toward it, he'll bring about the how. Asking how is one of the fastest ways to have nothing done because you'll always judge it according to what you've got or what you think you can do. And you'll limit what God can do. So right now I'm going to do a couple of things. I'm going to pray. I'm going to... There are many of you that are maybe sick in body. That's not God's will. We're going to pray. We're going to break these things. We're going to get this stuff off you and get you healed. We're going to pray. And whenever I say we're going to pray, I mean I want you to pray to God. And I want you to make the connection with him that you need to make. Maybe you're tight with God. Maybe you're walking with him. I mean, you hadn't missed a step. Maybe everything's great. Maybe you're more spiritual today than you've ever been in your life. Then you should be overjoyed that you get a chance to pray. Maybe you've been away from him a little bit. Maybe you've not walked away from him, but you've just been too busy, too caught up in the affairs of life, which chokes out the word and kind of, it doesn't necessarily break your fellowship with him, 
but you're just not as in close fellowship as you should be. And so I'm going to give everybody a chance. Maybe you don't know him at all. Maybe you've never bowed your knee to Jesus. Maybe you've never made him your Lord. Not just Savior, Lord. He, see, he's your Savior. He died and provided salvation. Right? But you need to make him your Lord. That's whenever you decide, I will do whatever you want me to do. My life is yours. And when you do that, see, when we say that, many times, if, you're, if you don't know him, you'll think, well, that means he's going to make me do this or make me do that. No, you have no idea the adventure that your life can become. Because I guarantee you, if he can take my life where it was and turn it around where I was just some kid here in Texas at that time, and turn my life around to where we are literally impacting the world. And he's actually taken my life and made something out of it. <coughs> he can do that with anybody. Because you have no idea where I came from. <laughs> okay? And yet he has done so much with it. And it has nothing to do with talent or anything else. It's just, we just keep walking. I've quit a thousand times, but I just keep showing up. So, if you just give him your life, he will turn your life into an adventure. Amen. And so I just want to give you that opportunity. So right now, as, as y'all can go ahead and play a little bit, just a minute. But let's just pray. First off, let's just pray this out loud with me. Just say it out loud. God, God. I recognize you. I recognize that your son Jesus came and died for me. He bore my sin. He bore my sickness. He bore the iniquities. And right now, God, I totally accept him because he accepted me. I bow my knee to him and I make Jesus my Lord. I will go where he says to go. I will do what he says to do. He is my Lord and Master. And right now, I am born again. His Spirit, right now, changes my spirit. And I'm no longer dead, but I am alive. Because the living Savior lives in me. So now, God, I call you Father. Jesus is my brother. And together, we will accomplish your will, Father. And right now, I recognize that what I can do at this moment to accomplish your will is simply draw closer to you. In soul, in, soul, in, thoughts, in thoughts, in heart, in heart. and in Jesus, name, in Jesus' name, I thank you, I thank you. Heavenly, Father, Heavenly Father, for being a God, being a God that, answers prayer, that answers prayer, that agrees to come to us, to and, us. and reveal yourself to us. Yourself. So in Jesus' name, Right now, now, I pray pray. and I say with my mouth, mouth, let there be peace in Jerusalem. Let Let the Son of Peace dwell there. there. And Father, we thank you. you. And we give you great great praise and honor honor. that you are are revealing revealing your Son, Jesus. To the people who walk in darkness, darkness. through visions, visions, through dreams, dreams, through encounters with missionaries, through encounters with with friends, friends. but you are revealing Jesus Jesus to people people who need him. him. And we say, say, "Let let it increase. Let your spirit Flow Flow. 
through every people, every nation, every tribe, everywhere throughout this world. And Father, we thank you that you will use us to cause this to happen. So in Jesus' name, we give you honor. And we say that the knowledge of the glory of the Lord will flood this earth. And your kingdom will be established and advanced and every knee shall bow and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. So right now, in Jesus' name, I say, you bore my sickness, so I must be healed. And I thank you for it. So be it. Amen. And right now, I just speak to you, whether you're here locally or by internet, the Spirit of God, the Word of God is not bound by location. It's not bound by distance. And I say right now in the name of Jesus, I set you free by the name of Jesus, by those stripes that was bore for you. You are healed, delivered, set free, born again, filled with the Spirit of God. And I say right now, sickness and disease, you will hear and obey the voice of the Word of God. Amen. You will set these captives free. You will leave them now. Sickness and disease, go and never return. You have no place here. You did not purchase these bodies. They belong to Jesus. And we evict you and command you to go. And right now in the name of Jesus, shame, fear, guilt, depression, all of these things, you're a liar. You cannot stay in these people. By the Spirit of God, we set them free. And we say now, in Jesus' name, be free now. So be it. Amen. Now begin to do what you could not do before. If you had a problem breathing, breathe. If you had a problem moving around, begin to move. Whatever it was you could not do before. Matter of fact, right now, in the name of Jesus, migraine headaches, I command you to cease. You will go now. I don't care the reason. You have no place here. So go in Jesus' name. Right now. Right now. Complete freedom in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 <clears throat> After service, we will be uh, doing the Feeding Jesus outreach. We'll be going downtown. So we will need some help putting the food together and getting everything together. Uh, so if you can stay around a little bit afterwards and help us prepare these things and then we'll pray over them also, then we would encourage you to do so. We definitely uh, want to uh, thank my brother Hazem and brother David and sister Sophia for coming our way this morning. And thank you all for bringing them our way and letting us know uh, it, was, it was God. <laughs> okay. So we appreciate that. We look forward to anything we can do. Uh, he has a couple of books, one now, one coming out soon that we'll be carrying on the book table if you want to uh, know more about that. He gave me a copy. copy. You can't have that one. That's mine. Uh, but when we get some more, we should have some more in the day or so. Uh, so you can get those. And um, we want to help in this. And there's things, you know, we can talk about these things, but you have to, honestly, you just have to keep things in front of you. And so that you remember these things. And that you remember that this, this is not it. It is out there. It's not about what we do in here. It's good to come together in fellowship. It's good to come together and be able to, as I brother said, just sing and be happy. That's great. But we have to remember that there are people out there that are not happy. People that are walking in darkness, people that are walking in pain, and the light of Jesus has to shine through us. And he gave a perfect example of what Jesus said, that by your love, people will know that you're my disciple. And that's exactly what he saw in these people. They were happy. They were showing love. They were communicating with each other. That's, that's being a Christian. And so we need to make sure that we let our light shine. Amen? Not just in here. We don't need your light in here. Amen? It needs to be shining out there in the darkness. 
And so we want to even make sure we are first and foremost a people who just share the heart of God, right? We don't want to be a healing church. We don't want to be a deliverance church. We don't want, no, we want to be a church of Jesus, amen? We want to be his church. We want to be his body and show his light, his life, his love to a world that doesn't have it, amen? amen. So other than that, now, if you do need ministry, you need to come down front, then come on down front. But I will say in Jesus' name, be blessed. You are dismissed.